Peter from Breaky Bottom, thank you for your invitation to come and see this most extraordinary place, Harvey, Harvey and Son, that I have known about ever since I came to the Lewis area, whose beer I've enjoyed ever since I came to the Lewis area, and to be actually here now where it's made, sensational. Well, it's lovely to have you with us, and uh, I say it's, it's uh, a, a marvellous heritage that we've both gone through over the last 40 years. Yeah, well here I am in the 40th year since I planted. Um, which is amazing. Which is, which doesn't is feel like that quite. No, no but, but uh, the, the lovely thing is that during that time you have established yourselves very much as uh, a local uh, vineyard, local winery, in a way that uh, was quite unique in those early days. But you've retained that identity, which is something yeah. that I think we ha have tried to do all through uh, our existence. But in the 1970s, when you were setting up, um, the campaign for real ale had just come yeah. on the scene, and so there was great demand for local beers. And we managed to retain a, a local identity and, and uh, restrict our distribution uh, mm. to the local area. So well, that, that's, that's a similarity. That's dear to my heart. I mean, I think we're five miles from here. Indeed. Breaky Bottom is about five miles from, from Lewis. And uh, I can only, I've got six acres of vines, so it's a small vineyard, small commercial vineyard, enough for a family to live off if you worked really hard. But I haven't ever harbour the idea of getting bigger and bigger and bigger in any way. I can't because I only have 30 hectares, uh, 30 acres in total. But, um, so, and I've always felt that there's an intimacy about harvest, which I applaud. And I know that local people do too. And people who come in from afar, they rejoice in it. And here I am, Fred Dibner, by the way, the extraordinary late Fred Dibner, he would be fascinated by what you've got here. I like our steam engine. I'm sure. Absolutely. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. I hope you're going to come to Breaky Bottom shortly and you won't see any F Fred Dibner reflections because it's plain stainless steel, but we're in a lovely old flint barn, which you'll see. Oh, marvellous. Well, I, I, I look forward to it. And uh, obviously, we, we have been on this site for a very long time and we have to grow within it. But a, a lot of stainless steel has replaced the copper, which I yeah. knew in my. Uh, early days here, and uh, well, that's just a sort of natural progression. Although we did replace a copper vessel with copper not that long ago. We, we felt it was a very intrinsic part of our heritage, but more important to beer than wine in that respect. Sure. Of course, the other thing with Harvey's at that time was that we were making the transition from wooden casks to stainless oh. steel casks, yeah. because there, there was little advantage to wooden casks with beer, because you couldn't sterilise wood, whereas you yeah. could metal, and the quality of beer went up immeasurably with the arrival of the stainless oh. steels. But of course, uh, sort of traditional wine producers in France presumably using wood casks or, or vessels. Yes, yeah. well, I mean, the great, the great maturing wines from Bordeaux and from Burgundy and, and uh, all sorts of other places in France, the Rhone wines, they are in cask, in wooden cask. So thank goodness that the, the coopers of today can still exist because there's plenty of demand. Yes, indeed. And if you look, just have a, a quick look at English wine, which is a real new thing. I mean, when, when I started, there were a handful of vineyards, maybe a dozen vineyards. They're now four or five hundred, and also bigger scale than ever I dreamt of. Than ever I wanted it. And some have come and gone, of course. Some and and you, inevitably. You, you've stayed. And I, I think the same could be said of, of uh, the small brewers that have come on the scene. Some uh, developed and then went. Some you know, yeah. came and went very quickly. Others have stood the course of time. So yeah. you know, there are parallels with it. Are, are. And uh, I think the big difference is that we turn around a product from raw materials to finished product in seven days and are drinking it <laughs> sort of two weeks later, yeah. whereas obviously very different with, with your own sure. production process. W w one thing we have in absolute common, we both make alcohol. We do, and we're and both we dependent on the harvest every year. Absolutely right. Right. Yes, well, with the campaign for real ale in, in 1970, obviously it, it brought a focus on beers locally with local branches, but also 
uh, made it far more uh, interesting on a national scale. And I think some brewers looked at the opportunities to develop their brands and distribute them nationally because yeah. there was sufficient interest. Uh, others, like ourselves, did very much remain local with a local identity. And I mean, part of that was due to the fact that we were um, only able to produce so much beer. And right. uh, th there was a period where we literally would shut the order book and we'd say to local customers, we can't supply you because mm -hmm. we're not going to cut corners. Uh, yeah. And then we'd put in another fermenting vest and we'd say, yeah. all right, we can supply you now. So it was yeah. halcyon days in that respect. And certainly we had enough trouble supplying locally uh, but we, we would never have even envisaged or wanted to go national at that point. Right. But break your bottom in its own way can't expand because I don't have any more land that's suitable for planting, but it suits me. Um, my order books are fairly full, but um, I wouldn't let it get out of hand so that I can't supply devoted people, sure. and I might even sell some wine to China or Japan is coming here because there's an active direct interest. I mean, now it's a very different market for brewers uh, such as ourselves because here we are in a, a grade two listed building uh, doing a very <laughs> traditional beer which comes at a cost and we're paying the full rate of excise duty on our beers whereas yes. smaller brewers setting up today have advantages of progressive beer duty, they're paying far less and they can produce on a very much cheaper scale so yeah. you know again we are very much holding our own and reliant on our reputation on our consistency and quality mm. and really on the sense of public ownership that people feel about harvests within our native and adjoining counties yeah this is very close to people's heart harvest mm. is i don't often come to lewis even though i'm so close but when I do come to this end of Lewis and see your wonderful buildings, even from the outside, it's just such wonderful, and the bridge looking back over. And of course the inevitable wonderful smell from Harvey sometimes. Ah, all those volatiles, yeah. 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 Lew Lewis Cathedral, we're known as locally. Well, there you so go. Certain ecclesiastical Fully reverence. justified, fully justified. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Here we are in the brewery shop where yeah. John Harvey was selling wines in 1810. I love the selection of wines you've got here too. This is obviously away from the brewery direct, but it just shows the people of Lewis not only come inevitably for their beer, but they can now learn, because I look down with a keen French grandfather, French mother's eye, and I can see they've got very nice wines here. I think our wine department have worked incredibly hard over the the years and they've done a, a marvellous job. My colleague Hamish Elder, very keen on wines and, and that heritage of the business and uh, no, it's all gone from strength to strength. Yeah, so that when I first showed wine to the Great Company and suggested that it might market it, a uh, certain raised eyebrow and a taste and a, yes we'll do this, but there were very, very few wines here in those days, as I recall. So yeah. Compared to what you've got now. Oh yes, compared to now. Yeah. Yes, I mean, we're sort of coming out of the age of Irondo, aren't we? Really? Yeah, but, really. <laughs> Lord. In the, in the supermarket um, across the road. I mean, was, I mean, wines were not as popular and no. a, a sort of um, of, of everyday consumption no. then as as it is now. Uh, it, it was very much high days and holidays, I think. The increase in English wines in the last decade and a half is almost exclusively for sparkling wines. Oh, really? That's sparkling wines, if you like, with the champagne method, mm. method champagne wines, uh, where we've got the very similar soils. I'm on chalk soil at Breaky Bottom, mm. which is what they've got, and very similar climate. We've been blessed with people who can show us how to do it, mm. and they're very willing nowadays. Mm. Uh, and it's a, it's a lovely parallel to have. Yeah. But I think of all the sparkling wines, method champagne wines in the world, I think the English sparkling wines are already, and will go on being, the nearest mimic to Champagne because we have very similar soil and similar climate. Interesting, the, 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 uh, the soil and the chalk. I mean, there is a, 
a slight connection with brewing insofar as our water supply, which filters through the chalk over 30 years, does impart a local character to our right. beer. So there is a, a vague similarity. Well, there is. Purpose on and that. if we were in Scotland tasting uh, malt whiskies, the local uh, malt whisky maker would be saying, you know, with Scottish accent, it's the water here which gives us this very special whatever. Yes, it's a glorious uh, expanse of. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, but it stayed, but it remains, it remains And I've got mostly Chardonnay, but the first few rows are of Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, the two black grapes permitted in Champagne. Champagne is a blend, normally. It can be a single white grape, Blanc de Blanc, just from Chardonnay. It can be Blanc de Noir, just the white juice squeezed out of red grapes. But more often than not, the ones we see, the non-vintage ones on the shops, on the shelves, is a blend. So I've got a few of the black grapes, but mostly Chardonnay. But you can see that these are... Here we are in um, early August. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's bunches and bunches. A little later on, we'll have to pull a few leaves away to allow the sun to get at them and to allow the air to circulate um, so that they don't get mildew. Uh, but there's somewhere to go. Somewhere to go. These will be picked mid to late October. So, really good looking crop this year. I'm sure this will go down, bar and disasters, as one of the best years for English wine. Yeah. Has to. And that's climate related? Uh, it's just what I call weather related. To keep out of the argument for the moment about global warming and climate change. Yeah, these are, these are Chardonnay grapes. Well, at this stage they look very similar to the Pinots we've just seen, and about the same, they'll be picked around the same time. Picking would normally be done over about 10 days. and. Uh, the Seval Blanc will be ripened a little bit earlier, so my whole variety uh, is a bit before, and then these are taken really within two or three days there. And how critical is it? Is there a point where it's right and you've got to do it? Yeah, it's a critical sort of balance. You want the acidity to diminish sufficiently, in other words, a full ripeness without being overripe. For champagne and for sparkling wines, you have to edit out any uh, botrytis mould that might exist. It might be sometimes 5 or 10 percent. Mm. But for fizz, good fizz, you have to edit that out. The process is, is extreme. So in fact you do sometimes leave 10 percent in the vineyard. And those are sheep over there. Ah, They don't always come. I've, you know, in our small, the steep banks, we can't plant grapes there, it's too steep and whatever. So I've got 40 ewes and, uh, and their offspring. And what breed are they? They are Suffolk and Suffolk crosses, ah. and I've just bought some some mules crossed with North Country sheep. Yeah, it's a lovely place though, isn't it? It's glorious. It's so the hills beyond glorious. are not breaky bottoms, but they've got wonderful cattle on there, and then goes just to the skyline of the, our neighbouring farms. Miles, uh, this is the winery. Lovely Sussex Flint barn. Dated at each end, 1827, which I guess um, is uh, it's the last of the old style flint barns, apparently. One of the most recent. Thereafter, they made other constructions. But it conforms to the old style, and it's the winery. And then Natural England said they wanted to go back, and they paid really for the Welsh slate on the barn and on this, on this outer building, um, handmade tiles. So it's really been rejuvenated now. But when I first came here, the tiny cottage, 48 years ago, worked on the main farm, uh, but lived here, and my charge was to look after the cattle in the winter that were, that were housed here. And the, being raised, that's where the fodder was and the bedding, so that the drunk would build up. And this was actually then open front, and they used to lie in there, under there in the bad weather. Yeah. 
not that they minded much, but they would used to put their big noses through my kitchen window in the morning, if I'm having a weekend and a later start, and say, where's the food? Coming up, Miles. And uh, big step, careful the last step. The wonder of the champagne method, which we adopt, is that there's two-stage fermentation. So the primary ferment is in the autumn, as if one was making still wine. Harvest in the autumn, squash the juice out. Uh, you can, we're allowed to put in some sugar, a limited amount, to get up to potential 11% alcohol. Put the yeast in and it, goes, and it goes dry. So that'll do it in the autumn, early winter, it's dry. As these are now, here we are in August, and they're going to be bottled next month. Second fermentation now takes place. After the second fermentation, it should lie on the dead yeast cells on the leaves for at least a year. Breaky bottom, it's more like three or four years where it gains, the wine gains flavours from that. And it goes fully dry again, and the alcohol will have gone from 11 up to 12.2, 12.3, something like that. Yeah. So these wines have actually been disgorged, so they're bright. I hope they're bright. Yeah, they are bright. But when they come into here, they're stacked in these bays that take about 3,000 bottles. Right. About four deep. And they sit here for at least two years, if not three years. Once they finish their fermentation, they just lie down there. And that's the secret, because a lot of English wine is going to be, I think, extra classy, because we're selling wines that have been three, four years on the lees. And that's very valid hugely in Champagne. But the, the non-vintage, Champagnes that one buys in big shops, supermarkets, whatever, and Harvey's too, I'm sure, that will probably not have had that length of time on the lees. It'll be good, it'll be good, sometimes astonishingly good. But the secret of the wonderful flavours from great vintage champagnes comes where ageing on the lees, on the dead yeast cells. So, that's how it is. When all this is full up, we can hold at least 50,000 bottles here. We've been drawing off recently because of demand and there's a bit less, but then when I bottle the 15,000 bottles from last year, we're going to have a housing problem again. We're going to have to shunt it all around again. Because that is five bays. Five threes of 15, yeah, five, five bays. So. Oh, one day more explode. So, here's one I prepared earlier, as they say. Um, I think this, I know this is Chardonnay from 09, 2009. So right. bottled in 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, it's been four years on the lees. And you'll see the bright one above yeah. and the leaves down there. Before Verve Clicquot, about 1800, processed the disgorging, the wine was drunk like that. Cloudy. If you're a rich household, you might have frosted glass to, to mask the cloud. Tasted good. Mm. Yeast is the source of this flavour. But uh, the triumph was when the disgorging method that she pioneered with her cellar master became established. It's the disgorging of, of sparkling wines now. There we go. Isn't it lovely? It's all great. I am, I am so pleased about today because I've, I've loved where we started. At Harvest and in the brewery. I love where we finish. <laughs> and, uh, w w yes, but for you, it's old hat in the nicest possible way where you work, and I know this place. But um, it was a joy for me to see the brewery, and um, I'm sure it's, it's been a same. joy, joy for me to see this. And, great, and isn't I it? just had no idea it was yeah. lying in the downs like this, and and all sort of so contained. I know, it's and it was my privilege, my delight, my good fortune as a young man to discover this place when it was uninhabited and forgotten. Forgotten. Mm. And over the decades, we and the family and whatever, and people who come here and friends, we've, we've made it into something again. We've reminded the whole world. It's a beautiful place. Indeed. Yeah. It's utterly delightful. Yeah. The whole concept. Super. Well, I'm, yeah, because I've, I've known you without knowing you, but it, today's been a delight because we know each other now. Indeed. Yeah, we can shake fists at each other as we walk by. <laughs> no, thank, you. thank you. Very thank much you, thank indeed. you.